Hello, everybody. We are talking today about if you are about to give up as an artist, how to stop comparing yourself to others. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. I thought we'd start out with an example of DP and I comparing ourselves to someone else in our industry. Now, Deepti, tell us about this. We're really excited because you have a movie that is coming out. Yeah, I just watched it actually on Sunday. It just had its festival premiere. And I think it's going to come out sometime early next year. So yeah, this was me on the red carpet the other day. Um, and my amazing, some of the amazing cast and crew there. Um, so this is a f indie film I did last year, super indie, super in independently produced, super scrappy kind of production. Um, not scrappy, but just like, you know, we didn't have a studio backing us or anything like that. So um, there was a lot of heart put into this film. Um, and yeah, and it just came out and it was really fun to watch it and see what I did and all of that. Um, but yeah, so that's like my acting world. But of course, you know, um, you kind of, I, I feel like I get in my head a lot about like, okay, cool. I just had my first leading role in an indie feature film. And I'm, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I am older than Florence Pugh, um, who is younger than she seems, which that was shocking for me to find out how old she was because I'm not that much older than her, but like, um, she it, it's, I guess in the acting world, it's so easy to compare yourself to people. I also fell into acting. I don't really have like that much training really before I started doing it. Um, so in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm behind and I'm like having these cool experiences, but then I'm like, oh my God, this person's younger than me and they've done so many cool films and are now in the new dude. And it just makes my like, you know, little, not little, it's not little, but my feature film that I did feel so little. Um, so definitely like you could be kind of feeling like, oh my God, I just had this premiere. I just got to walk a red carpet. I just, you know, do, do all these things. And then you open Instagram in the morning, you get slapped in the face with youthful Florence Pugh and the new dude. And you're like, oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, the age thing really stings because I'm the same way. I see somebody else who's done something way ahead and they're 10 years younger than me. It's like, oh, ouch. <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it almost feels like we're all on this, like, which is not true, but we're, it feels like we're all on the same path. And it's almost like people are running faster than you. Um, and you're yeah. like, what the heck? But then, you know, for me, I have to remind myself, like, she's been doing this for way longer. She probably has a lot of um, connections or privilege that I don't have or things that I didn't know. I, I figured this all out on my own. I started much later. There are so many things that are, um, there's probably something that I'm really good at that she's not good or I'm, I'm ahead of her in something, you know, I'm probably, I'm probably a better animator than she is, or just further along in my animation career than she is. But that doesn't mean that she's not an amazing animator if she wanted to give it a shot. But still for me, I know that I understand that concept, but I have a lot of difficulty getting past it. So mm -hmm. tell us in the chat, do you compare yourself to other artists? Do you do it to the point where it becomes paralyzing? Is it more casual comparing? Because deep D mine is so much more toxic. <laughs> Maybe I just take things too seriously. But for me, the latest comparison I've been making is I've been doing all these Sweeney Todd illustrations. Did this one of Mrs. Lovett. I did this quick one of Josh Groban, who is currently in the show, and Aaron Tibbet's going to be in, in March. And yes, my head is exploding. So I'm really thinking about Sweeney Todd a lot lately. But of course, I just look at the dude who did the official Playbill illustration, which is plastered everywhere. You see Sweeney Todd in ads and huge billboards in the New York Times. And I'm like, oh, here I am with my dinky little illustrations and I'm making them for fun. And this guy probably got paid thousands of dollars. He got to do a photo shoot with the stars and everything. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I feel so lame. Like, what do you do with this deep D? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think you just have to learn 
coping mechanism, coping, coping mechanisms. Wow. Sorry. That was hard to say. Um, and just also realize that like that kind of mindset is going to do nothing good for you. Um, or find a way to, which is, I think, you know, we'll get to this, but I think that's where I've gotten to is like, there's so much comparison as an actor, any kind of artist, but as an actor, especially I've been finding that really difficult. So just finding ways to use that to fuel you, um, see if there's a way in which seeing other people's work and successes can actually be exciting for you and, and fuel you rather than bring you down, which most of the time I feel like it will do. Well, this brought me down. So of course I looked up his work, Franz Zoni. I don't know how to say it exactly, but I looked at his Instagram, but then I clicked on the link to his shop. And that is what killed me is his shop he has all these prints and they're limited editions and they're expensive they're 300 dollars. he sells tons and tons of them and a couple weeks ago i opened my bread fairy print shop which i've been working really hard on my prints are much lower 30 dollars, 35 dollars. and since it's been open dfd i've sold one print Granted, I have not spent the amount of time I need to spend on marketing and all those things, but it still made me really sad <laughs> to have that comparison. Dude selling out hundreds of prints for 300. I'm like, I sold one. I feel so stupid. And it's like when it's numbers that you're comparing, it's even worse. And yours are so reasonably priced. Well, hopefully after this stream, you'll see a surge in sales. But yeah, no, I mean, yeah, when you're comparing numbers, when you're comparing, like, when it's so tangible like that, it can really mess with your head. So I feel you. Let's see. We have some comments in the chat. Ginger says, there's always that 15-year-old who is ridiculously good at whatever they do. And Charlie points out it's a rite of passage in every medium to accept that the world has child prodigies whooping you. It feels like the stages of grief. I know it just baffles my head. And I wonder deep if one of the coping mechanisms is just to be like, give up. Yeah, yeah, you're better. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. I don't think that's giving up really other than, or just being like, okay, cool. Maybe you are like, quote unquote, better than me but that does that discount me and everything that I've done and you know I, there for every 10 people that you feel like are better than you there are 10 people that think you are better than them so it's just like a toxic cycle you know like um and I I think giving up isn't the right thing because I feel like that's like putting the brush brush down and never getting back at it and that's not what is that going to do for you nothing but um I do think having that thought and pushing it away and giving up on that thought and moving past it. Um, I'm getting so like therapy right now, but like, I think, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think that is, um, that's the way to go about it. Because ultimately it's just a waste of time. There's nothing productive about comparing yourself because in that time that I was looking at that guy's shop, I could have been, doing something to improve myself. I could have spent some time figuring out marketing. In fact, today I sent out probably 50 emails to advertising agencies, the ones that put together these types of campaigns because I want to see if they can hire me. And mm -hmm. that's much better than just seething because there's only so much time in the world. And so we have to, from a practical point of view, say, hey, that's a waste of time. Totally. And I will say that almost all the time that you waste, there's even more time later that you're like ruminating on the, that thought. Like you could be, like you said, working on your materials, taking a nap, eating healthy food. There are so many things that you could be doing for yourself that aren't even related to your art. That's not, um, that's not productive. And like, if, even if you are looking at other people's art to be looking at it in a negative way is really not going to benefit you in any way. If you're looking at it and you're like, Ooh, what can I learn from this person? Maybe then that's a way to kind of like compare yourself and think about it more positively and learn from it. But just putting negative thought in your brain is not only going to hurt you in that moment, but it's going to stick with you and affect you in the future. It's going to eat you alive. That's yeah. what happens to me. I'm just such a drama queen. 
<laughs> well, this is a great point from Jane, who says, I know I'll never be rich and famous for my art. So as long as I'm enjoying it and evolving, that's all that matters. Because I do think, Deep D, that it's not a great idea to let your self-worth as an artist be determined by, did I get a job? Did I get a book deal? Because you're going to go crazy waiting around for that book deal. And during that time, you're just making yourself feel worse. So I was telling somebody earlier today that you have to find a way to create that self-worth on your own without someone else's approval. That's exactly what it is, is I feel like waiting for that book deal, waiting for that job, waiting for, um, you know, in my case, someone to hire me um, to act or my agents to send me an audition. That's like waiting for other people's approval. Um, and there are so many factors that go into other people's approval. You might just look like someone's ex partner and they might not like you for that. Re like there's so many things that have nothing to do with your quality of work or how talented you are when you're waiting for other people's approval. So to find that in yourself, I think is the best um, method of working because you can't guarantee that that's even going to give you any sort of satisfaction. Lena makes a good point. I haven't done art since high school, now starting again in my 30s, and I was so much better back then. Well, we have a ton of people in this community who did art at one point, had careers, did other things, and are coming back to it. In fact, tell us in the chat if you're one of those people. And I know sometimes it feels like you're a really out of shape athlete. But the thing is, I like to tell myself, it's not that I'm getting worse, I'm just different. I'm so different in my 40s than I was in high school, thank God. And sometimes you can't see it as linear progress as much as it just you're going around doing things. Yeah, totally. It's funny, actually, sometimes I look at the work I did in high school and I'm like, oh, my God, I was better at watercolor in high school than I am right now. Like it's it's. Um... But then it's nice to be like, well, I was there so I can obviously get back there, you know, like it, it's in me. Absolutely. And sometimes it really is picking up a bike. Other times it's not. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I really try to remind myself and other people of this, which is unique to our field. In science, you can win the Nobel Prize and the Pritzker Award if you are an architect. And I suppose we have our own versions of Caldecott medals and Guggenheim grants and stuff like that. But that is such a tiny percentage of how you can invent your own success. So instead of getting mad, that, oh gosh, it's another year I didn't win the Guggenheim, find a place where you can actually get out there and make that success. And a lot of people don't realize that you really can do this as an artist if you're determined. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many, like, it's it's like goal setting, you know, for me, that's how I like invent my own successes. It's like figuring out what is achievable within my scope and my reality and then set goals. And that feels like a mini success for me. And then I feel like getting that outside approval, you can just have accountability partners tell people like, hey, I'm trying to accomplish this series and I'd love to share it with you by the end of this month, which is my goal. And then not only have you accomplished that for yourself, but you then get to like share it with people. You could even have a little like show for your friends in your apartment. Like it doesn't have to be big, but those are goals that you can set. And then you get outside approval because like people are on that journey for you accomplishing that goal, like with you. And so they're like, they're celebrating you. And it's less even about the work really. And the fact that you like, you did the dang thing, like you did it. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that that's a huge success. And that's like you being like, okay, what can I do that I know I can achieve, but it's still a challenge and a goal for me. Um, and those are those successes that I think really are, feel fulfilling. I think because of the way technology is now, the tools that artists have right at their fingertips, it just blows my mind. I think about old print publications, magazines, and newspapers. I'm like, how did anybody get any visibility if you had to be in the New York Times for anybody to know about you? And I just have seen so many artists do such wonderful things to create their own places, to find their own version of success. 
certainly there's the traditional forms of success. Like you'd say, oh, if I want to be a children's book writer, a lot of people do really want to be published by a publisher. But I also know people who have self-published, people who have done something which is not the traditional children's book and done really well. So I think deep deep people don't realize how much is in your lap that you can just go do it, not wait. Totally. There's so many things. I think it's like expanding the mindset and like seeing what's readily available for you rather than like, you know, something that's like 20 steps ahead and will only depress you. <laughs> well, this is a great point from Calm Cuke. I think the better you get at something, the more you compare because you've trained your eyes literally and figuratively to see your flaws. Artists particularly are great at knocking their success. This is very true because oftentimes our skill has not caught up with our eye mm. that we can recognize, wow, that's a fantastic painting. And I know why it's fantastic, but I can't do it myself. Have you ever been at that point, Deep D, where the skill doesn't quite align with your own knowledge? Oh my God, I feel like I'm there all the time, like every step in the way, you know, like I walk into a museum and I'm thinking that all the time, like especially with mediums that I have never really learned, um, you know, like printmaking or sculpture, there's certain mediums where I'm just like, I'm so impressed because I know the effort and the skill that it takes and the thought behind it, but there's no way I would even know where to begin with that. Um, I took a glass flame working class the other day and it was, you know, a three hour class and I made the tiniest little thing and I was like, oh my goodness, like I see glass work all the time and I think, wow, like the skill and I, and I feel like I can crit critique it and be like, oh, they could have done better. And then I try it myself and I'm like, oh my goodness. And it's what? so frustrating, you know, but at the end of the day, I still have to be proud of myself for trying and, and know that like, okay, if I keep putting in the work and I keep putting in hours and, you know, I, I can get there, I can get somewhere. Great point from Lisa. The goal of success may not be for everybody. It may be helpful to ponder what really makes you content. Your why may be very simple. I mean, I'm like Anna here. I'm like, I want the MacArthur, <laughs> that type of thing. But not everybody needs to aspire to that. I know some people just want to learn how to do something really well. And so Deep do you think sometimes it's helpful to try to define that for yourself? Definitely. And, and defining it more so than defining it, I think is like having like different levels of goals. Like, I don't think it's bad to be like, I want a MacArthur. Like why limit yourself to thinking that you shouldn't have that? But I don't think that should be your one and only goal. You know, <laughs> that's, that's like, that will drive you nuts. But having like a realistic, it's like having like, you know, like what's your six month plan? What's your one year plan? What's your five year plan? What's your 10 year plan? And breaking things down like that. So you feel like even if the MacArthur might not happen or is kind of huge, <laughs> there are still other things that you're accomplishing that's within the scope. And then I mean, why, why say no to the MacArthur? Maybe it'll come like, you know, but you can't only have laser focus on that. Here's another thing we all have to remember. This is part of being alive. No one but you has your story. And a big part of it is getting specific because there's so many stories that we've heard a billion times. But Deep D, why do you think they're constantly reinventing or reviving things? I mean, the Sweeney Todd that's on Broadway right now is a revival from the original that was in the 70s or the 80s, I can't remember. But why do people keep doing that? It's the same story. I mean, I think people relate to it and people love it. And there's a there's a fan base there and they want to see it, but they want to see it with some like new pizzazz and, and new jazz. But then again, it's like, it's the same old thing. Like, I think people are desperate for new stories as well. It's just, you know, like they're, people are putting the money where, where it works, but then something new will come out and like erupt, you know, cause it's like something that no one's ever seen before. One example that always comes to mind for me is, you know that, is it Boz Lerman who directed the Romeo and Juliet film, the one with Leonardo DiCaprio 
and Claire Dane. Um, I think it's Osborne. Anyway, yeah. Somebody can correct me in the chat. But so I was in high school when that movie came out and we had to watch all these really stale, like 1950s dry Shakespeare films. And when that movie came out, our heads explode. What? This is Shakespeare. And that aquarium like, shot, that like fish tank aquarium shot. I had a poster of that. Oh, it went better. Oh my God. But that's such a great example that how many Romeo and Juliet movies and stagings have there been? But that was such a fresh take. Like nobody had ever done something like that before. And so even if you are working with a story that is well known and people have seen it a billion times, there is a way to put your voice on that. And I think we have to keep that in mind because people will say things like, oh, well, that's been done. Or, oh, if I do that, it's not original. But it's like, you got to give yourself a little faith that you can make it your own. Absolutely. It reminds me of um, the Cinderella movie that had Brandy, you know, as Cinderella and Paolo Montalban, I think, as Prince Charming and Whoopi Goldberg as a fairy godmother. <laughs> like, you know, like that was such an iconic film and Cinderella, everyone knows Cinderella, but like what a way to like reinvent it and have, you know, casting that is so unique for that time, especially. Um, and people love that film. I think they just did like a, a revival or a, like a reunion of that film, you know, but that's like such an iconic Cinderella. And it's so good, like beyond the fact that it's just like unique casting and, and was like revolutionary for that time. Gessie says, dealing with terrible self-esteem, perfectionism, and the terrible habit of comparing myself, I try to remember that I just like to draw certain things and I like particular things. I just love that deep, deep, because when it comes down to it, isn't that what we're doing as artists? Totally. Like, no one is forcing us to be artists. You know, like, or I have yet to meet someone that's like, you know, like, I'm being, I'm, being told that I have to do this. Um, we're doing it because we like it. And I think like, um, you know, from this comment, it makes me think about like, I try to remember that I just like to draw certain things and I like particular things. Like that's already something that certain people are trying to find out. They're like, what do I like to draw? Why am I doing this? You know, so that's already something that I feel like you, like someone might be jealous of you for being able to say that I know that I like certain things and I know that I like to draw certain things. So like, again, it just makes me think of like, someone out there might be comparing themselves to you because you love to draw one certain thing and you know what that vision is. Um, but everyone has that thing that they're, that they are good at and draws them to being an artist. And I think holding on to that and remembering that is really what will like keep us going. This one I think is really important for everybody to remember is that technique skills they only take you so far. I understand how if you're just getting started and you don't have a lot of experience with say oil painting, that you do feel behind because you are, <laughs> you just got started, very beginning of the race. But sometimes people hold up technical skill on a huge pedestal at the expense of other parts of the art making process that are just as important, if not more. And this is probably the, one of the most common things people tell me. They say, I'm not very good. Everybody else is better at painting than me. And I, I just think there's way too much emphasis on this. Yeah. And I feel like technique is like kind of like that numbers thing where you're like, it's easy to compare because you're like, oh no, they are better at like this than that. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times when you ask someone why they, who their favorite artist is and why they like them, very rarely do I hear technique involved, you know, you're like, you're yeah. like, it's a lot of times it's like the emotions or what they draw or um, something about the artist themselves and, uh, and that's what draws people to them. So I think that like, and Sorry to say it, but you technique can be learned. But I think the other stuff mm -hmm. it really is so much more difficult to teach. And this comes from like the fact that I have taught for so long. Like I can teach anyone 
to animate and I'm still learning and there's all these techniques that you can learn, but to like create a film that really makes someone feel the emotions, to create a painting that transports people to another world or inside of your brain, that is so unique and so special. And I think people don't pay enough attention to the fact that we all have that capability. Because again, it goes back to like, what's our story? What's our unique story? What's our unique voice and our vision? Um, and those are the things that like, you really can't compare yourself to anyone else because you haven't lived the same exact life as anyone on this planet. And that's where you should be drawing things from. And that's where you should feel inspired from. The other thing is, I know so many artworks that honestly, on purpose, have super crappy skills. The one that comes to mind is Don Hertzfeld. If you guys want to see his work, there's one animated film. It's very short. It's like a minute. And it's called Billy's Balloon. Look it up on YouTube. Deep, deep, I don't laugh at anything. People <laughs> show me stuff and I'm like, whatever. I laughed so hard looking at this animation. Like my stomach was like in pain. It was so funny and it's literal stick figures. But why did the stick figures not matter? Like, why is it so funny? Can you explain that? Because the story is there. The story is relatable. You know, it's like, yeah. And I also feel like the stick figures lend itself narratively to kind of like the humor and the joy of all of it. But yeah, it's like, it doesn't matter that it wasn't like, honestly, I think it actually wouldn't have been as funny if it was like in Pixar levels, no. you know, there's something really nice to the fact that Dawn is like leaning into the kind of scrappy silliness of the visual aspect and kind of tying that into the, um, the the storytelling of it all you know it, it all lends itself to each other also here's a point from lena who's asking is getting proportions right a technical skill well let's put that in the context of figure drawing just so we can illustrate it a little bit better but i would say yes there are so many times people talk to me about figure drawing and they want help and i'll actually start up by saying well what's your goal what kind of figure drawings do you want to make and most of the time people say i want it to look accurate and sure, that's a good goal, but that's one particular skill that is very different than saying, oh, I want to make figures that have a sense of pathos or whatever it is that you want them to have. <laughs> Reminder, everybody, fall raffle just a few more days to help us keep our content free without any paywalls. It ends on Saturday. And <coughs> if you give a super chat, or a super sticker right now that also will enter you into the raffle because all of our video content is free and we just ask twice a year that you help us out a little bit and we have cool prizes for example you can win one of my non-selling <laughs> print favorite prints it's like great the only time anybody wants it is when i give it away which feels really crappy but anyway i'm over it They'll be worth so much one day. People will be like, I should have got one when they were $35. <laughs> Here's another one is I do think a lot of us perceive art as being a race that, oh, this person's ahead of me. I will never catch up. That person's so far ahead. And I understand that because that is a really digestible way to look at progress. But it's just not like that. No, because again, like art is a journey more so than a race. And it is something that takes so much out of you, I feel like, being an artist so that um, some people are just not able to give the amount of time to art that some other people can. Some people, whether it's financial reasons, whatever. Um, and so you have to kind of just be aware that you're only really like, you only should be comparing yourself and racing against the previous version of yourself. Um, yeah. It's really, you can only do it with yourself because for someone else, um, the resources that they have, the access that they have, the privilege that they have, the time they have, everything is so vastly different than another person's that it's just not like, it's it's not a logical thing to do to feel like it's a race. It just doesn't make sense. The other thing is, not all skills are more important than others. So for every person who is older and says, oh, I'm many decades behind, I can't draw with the skill set that this 18 year old has, 
an 18 year old will say to me, I don't know what to do. I have all this skill. I don't know what to draw. I have no ideas. And sometimes I'll talk to the older people and they'll say, well, I'm bursting with ideas. I just don't have the skill that I want to be able to do it. And so just because somebody is good at skill, it doesn't mean they are well-rounded enough to be able to really flush out what they want to do as an artist. I think this is very important to stop comparing yourself if you share your art in a small group. And I know this works because we have the Discord and we also have the Patreon group, which is a very small group of artists. And Deep Deep, it's so different when you're in conversation with artists as opposed to the guy I saw online who I was comparing myself to. Like, I didn't talk to him. We didn't interact at all. And so why is it different when you get to talk to your, I don't want to call it competition, but other people. <laughs> Well, I bet you if you talked to that guy, he probably would have a felt so much more like a real human um, and B told you yeah. about like he probably has all the same and probably more, um, you know, feelings in himself of doubt and comparisons. And I'm sure that if he looked at your work, he'd be like, oh, but, you know, I wish I could do this like you. And I wish like, oh, this like I'm sure that there would be a back and forth and he would find things in your work that he wished he could do. And I think that's something great about our Discord page is that everyone is so uplifting for each other. And it's also like a community where it's not just like you show your work one time. It's like you're really a part of a community and a group that you can trust and know that people will um, really care for you and your work. And it makes you realize that like everyone is on this journey and every our Discord is full of just every single kind of human from every corner of the globe that you could find all age ranges. Like it's really, really a cool space. So it's a great place to go in and not feel isolated. Like if you think you're the only like 60 something year old person who just picked up watercolor, who lives in Nebraska, like I bet you, you can find someone on a similar journey in our discord page. Well, it's a great point from Apple who says having artistic peers with shared life experience is important to me and I feel much more supported and inspired when I gather with other disabled artists. Mm. Yeah, having that connection because we spend so much time looking at other artists' stuff but never talking to them. You see somebody in an art textbook, you see somebody have a show at a museum and that lack of interaction makes it hard to not compare yourself because once i meet somebody like my friend kathy speranza who i am supremely jealous of her painting skills but she's my friend now and i'm like i can't be mad she's my friend <laughs> like it somehow is better when you're friends with the people you think you're jealous of right and also like when you're friends with them you can also be like hey how'd you do that hey do you want to like yeah. share like you know it, it suddenly doesn't become a competition and it becomes more like oh, I can like learn from this person and celebrate them and, and be on this journey with them. And, you know, I, I'm a strong believer on if your friends are growing and moving on up in this world and you're inspired by them, you're also going to go up because hopefully you're surrounding yourself by amazing people that bring you up with them. Um, so that's good. You should be friends with people that you admire. Thank you so much, Anna, for the super sticker. Remember, everybody, if you give a super chat or a sticker during this stream, that does enter you into the raffle. If you want more information on prizes, that type of thing, just go down to the video description below and you will find information about that. All right, let's take a look at putting on blinders. Now, I really encourage people to look at art history, look at contemporary art, see what other artists are doing, get ideas from them. But at a certain point, you've got to just not do it for a little while. So doesn't that seem weird that I would say, oh, look at all these artists, but now stop. I mean, I think it's it's um, advice that like someone should know when to take. Um, if you find yourself constantly like doom scrolling and sucking yourself into portals of feeling crummy and all of that, yeah, put those blinders on. Like you, you know, when you're in the place where like nothing, another person's successes makes your blood boil or makes you feel like dropping everything 
put those blinders on um, because what is what good is that doing for you? If you're feeling like quitting and you're feeling like crying and you're feeling like so crummy about yourself, um, don't waste, it goes back to don't waste your time, <laughs> like do something productive. I'm curious to hear from other people. Do you guys follow artists who you compare yourself to where it becomes a negative experience? Because I purposefully do not. So the illustrator, Franz Zoni, who did the Sweeney Todd Playbill image, I don't follow him. And there's a reason. Because <laughs> if I'm seeing him just popping out all these things, and it, it, I just don't want to see that. I mean, I'll look at his account if I need help or want to get some ideas or something. But for the most part, I don't follow people who I compare myself to. I'm wondering, do you do that, Deep D? Um, I think I'm at a place right now where I do follow people um, because for me, I think I'm I'm at a place right now where following people that I feel like Florence Pugh, for example, I, there's so many. I, I used her as an example just randomly, but there's so many. Um, right. And animators too. I think I like to follow them because seeing their successes kind of like lights a fire under my belly to like, put in the work and and get my career moving. But also like, I like to follow people's social media because I like to see like, who are they inspired by? Like, who are they collaborating with? Who do they follow? Who are they, you know, um, what's their process like? You know, if I were to scroll on someone's Instagram that is like, you know, in the new Dune, where were they in like 2012? What were they posting? You know, like what projects were they doing? Um, so for me, it feels kind of more like researchy and I'm kind of, like in my little stalker mode, but like more so just like, oh, like, okay, like, you know, what gets you going? What helps your career? I want to learn. Um, so that's where I'm at. Like, I'm not really like, but I've totally been in that place where social media and the internet has like brought me to a dark place. Um, and in those moments, you, yeah, you got to put the blinders on. So right now I'm, I'm, I'm more so just like excited to see other people thriving. And I want to like learn from that and also move in that direction and feel inspired. But there are dark times and in those dark times <laughs> you can pause your instagram you can delete your instagram you can never look on your phone do what you need to <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> at least in my case but that's another thing is for me what's helped to not compare myself to those people is to use them as research because you bet i looked at franzoni's posts about sweeney todd and he actually tagged every single person that was involved in that commission. And so he listed all the art directors, all of the support. I was like, oh, like looking at all of the people, I'm like, follow, 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 follow. And it's like, I never would have had that information if I hadn't gotten onto his Instagram. So sometimes turning it into something that's really practical and productive can make it so that way things don't feel so out of your reach. We've got some super stickers here. We've got one from Jesse who says, glad you got your Instagram back. Oh my God, you guys. I, I'm <laughs> in disbelief that it's back. Like, I was so ready to just start from scratch. So thank goodness we are back on Instagram. And we have a sticker from Apple and also a sticker from Janice. Thank you guys all for those super chats. So incredibly helpful to us to have all of that. By the way, we also have, again, the fall raffle. Put it in, $5, $10. It, it does not have to be significant. And you know, our budget is small enough that $50 is a big difference to us. I mean, I'm sure Airbnb doesn't care, but I'm like, $50, oh, I can cover the monthly annual fee for our Flickr page. So that way I don't have to take it out of my own pocket. So these things really, really matter to us, everybody. Also, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. Mia will draw your cartoon. If you pledge $50 or more, three people are going to win this prize. The other prizes aren't like that. The other prize is just one person wins. So three people are going to get their cartoon drawn. I mean, what was it like, DP, when you got yours? Oh, my God. It's so cute. I love it. It's like I don't have anything that's like that. It's so cute. And also just to have it be done by Mia, who's an icon. I'm like, that's just awesome. It feels so 
It's so fun to be seen, perceived by the Mia. <laughs> Please join us right after the stream. We are going to have a stage session in our Discord, and that is where you get to chat with Deep D and I on voice. Join our Discord. It's so much fun in there. I'm in there pretty much every day giving people support. Deep D and Mia are in there as well. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, personal art curriculum, statement editing, and portfolio critiques. Huge, huge thank you to our top Patreon supporters. You guys are it. You are almost our entire budget. And that's why we are constantly asking for your support. I am dreaming of the day that I never have to ask for support, but we're definitely not there yet. <laughs> Visit artprof.org. We have so much content on there that's not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And Buddy would like you to subscribe for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.